Universal motors are not very common in industry, but they're so common in the home and in consumer usage devices, they're worth talking about. It's interesting because they can operate on AC or DC. And they're very common. Uh, if you have a handheld drill, for example, that is not cordless, it probably has a universal motor. And the current's provided through brushes that ride on a commutator uh, that's on the rotor. So the, the rotor actually has windings in it that power flows through. So it's not just induction. Now these do typically run at high speeds. They are fairly noisy partially because of the brushes. They're also electrically noisy because the brushes bounce on the commutator and so you know there's always arcing that occurs and so you can actually see that frequently through, through vent holes and so that generates electrical noise as well. Um, so they're both acoustically noisy and electrically noisy. They typically have very poor speed regulation, so the load, as the load changes quite a bit, the speed will change quite a bit, but they have very high power to weight and power to size ratios. And so that's very useful for devices that need to be handheld, right? You don't want a, a really heavy drill that doesn't have much power. And so these are, are fairly common devices. Even a lot of table saws will use this. Now as you get into nicer table saws, you'll notice they're heavier because they don't use universal motors and they're quieter. But, you know, the table saw I have has a universal motor in it. And again, it provides weight savings, which is good because this is a mobile table saw, so it's an important feature. But, you know, handheld power tools, uh, they're, they're plug-in type, almost guaranteed to have universal motors, vacuum cleaners, uh, blenders in the kitchen, all those sorts of things are going to have universal motors. So these are probably the most common type of motor you would find in the home at least in the smaller size range. The compressor in your, your AC unit or a large fan, say a whole house fan, would probably use a, a different type of motor. So you can see here the speed regulation curve for a um, uh, couple of universal motors. And uh, you can tell that the speed regulation is almost non-existent, right? I mean, this torque speed curve looks very different from what we've seen, where it's very highly sloped and a relatively small change in required torque generates a large change in speed and for comparison there's a, a typical DC operation of a universal motor there and depending on the frequency of the current you know there's the, the speed regulation changes but you the whole idea here is that universal motors have very poor speed regulation so DC motors are a little different in that they don't uh, operate on AC they require DC and that can come from several different sources the one big advantage of DC motors is you can control their speed by changing the voltage to them. So if you have a uh, handheld drill, if you have, I don't know, um, any electronic device that has a motor, your cell phone for example, will have or will use DC motors for the vibration uh, when you get a text message or whatever, or when you get in a call. Um, DC motors can be controlled very easily by simply changing voltage, which is easier to do than, say, controlling frequency of current in an AC motor. And, of course, it's easy to control the direction by simply interchanging the wires. You, you flip the wires, the motor goes in the opposite direction. So the, the ability of a DC motor to be controlled, its uh, ease of control, is one of the main reasons that they're used. And, of course, because battery-operated devices are so convenient as well. Now, the torque in a DC motor can be adjusted by controlling current. Uh, and motors usually have, or DC motors usually have good quick response to changes in voltage. So you can control them very rapidly. You can change their speed very rapidly. And of course, DC motors are very common in your car, for example. Your car has a, a battery, 12 volt battery, and that battery needs to be able to supply current to a DC motor that you call a starter, right? And without that starter, uh, your car doesn't run, right? Because you need that electric motor to get the the car started, I guess if you have an old crank car, <laughs> you can get out and crank it, but uh, it's a lot easier to just turn the key over or even push a button nowadays. And the starter engages and starts the engine. But of course you need that type of motor because you got what's available, DC, right? Now, a couple of disadvantages to DC motors, similar to universal motors, a DC motor has brushes and so there's always the electrical noise from the arcing. There's also typically acoustical noise because of the brushes bouncing as well. Um, and the requirement of the brushed connections to the rotor uh, 
is really the the root of this problem. Whereas in an in, uh, uh, an AC motor that's an induction motor, you don't require electrical connections to the rotor. Now the DC motors you're familiar with are a little different probably than the DC motors that are more common in industry. In industry, you use um, a coil to generate the magnetic field on the stator as well as the coil in the armature. And so the a lot like a universal motor, there's two separate coils, but obviously it's operating on DC. It's a DC designed motor. And there are differences between the design of a DC motor and a universal motor. But anyway, so you generate the external field with a coil and the way you wire that field well, you, you have choices, and there's so-called shunt-wound motors. That's the top row here. And you can see the electrical schematic in the graph where the DC supply supplies power to the, the, um, the rotor field and, that's the brush connection, and to the stator field, or the shunt field is what it's called here. And you can see the way that the torque speed curve results. Again, I'm not trying to focus on the electrical side of this and the details of the electrical side as much as how the electrical configuration changes the mechanical uh, torque speed curve. That's what we're really interested in so that we can select an appropriate motor for a given application. Now, in the shunt wound configuration, there's a couple different things you can do to control speed. If you put a variable resistor in line with the rotor, essentially, then increasing the resistance decreases the current into the rotor and decreases the speed. Now, you can put uh, resistance in line with the rotor. You can put it around the rotor and control the, the rotor speed that way. You could also choose to put a resistor in line with the coil that's in the uh, stator winding, the one that doesn't turn. So a stator stationary, you know, same name, rotor, rotation, you see where these names come from. But if you put a resistor in line with that external stator field, then increasing the resistance actually increases speed. So uh, you can control these motors fairly, fairly easily. The compound wound type motor is a little different because you not only have a shunt field, you also have a field that's in series, and those two fields together generate the stator winding or generate the stator field in the, the stator winding. Uh, and you can see how the torque speed curve varies and changes a little bit. You get a, a benefit in added torque, but poorer speed regulation. Now what if we take it to the limit and have no shunt field? What if we just have a series field? Well these can be dangerous because you'll notice that at no load the motor speed can increase theoretically without limit. In reality there is a limit because of bearings do provide some load. But this can actually be very dangerous. So this type of motor has very high starting tor torque. That's the advantage. But it's kind of like a double-edged sword. So you can control the speed here, again, by putting resistance in, resistances in various locations around the uh, circuit, across the rotor, uh, in line with the, the uh, series field and rotor field, and control the speed that way. Um, but realize this is a, a beast to be tamed. Now, the type of motor you're probably familiar with, it's a DC motor, is called the permanent magnet motor. And here the, si the stator field is generated by just permanent magnets, so there's no current flowing through that, and you simply allow current to flow through the rotor. And this type of uh, motor, DC motor, has a very linear uh, torque speed curve, and that can be a big advantage. Now, in all of these, we're not so much talking about motors that you're going to find at home, although the motors you find at home that are DC motors are probably all permanent magnet motors. We're more talking about industrial motors. And so you see the uh, typical ratings of some uh, DC motors there, and then the, the NEMA code that goes with those uh, voltage ratings. Feedback control is another important uh, thing to talk about in motors. Often in DC motors, you're using them because they are so easy to control uh, speed and torque and so forth. And so often what you're doing is somehow measuring the, say, speed output of the DC motor and then using a control system to either increase or decrease the voltage to the motor so that you can get a desired speed out of the motor. So that's one way to do it. Sometimes what you care about is the position of the motor, say in a robotic application. So you might control the speed, but you also might control the position through a feedback device called an encoder. And so you've got a, a current loop control uh, where you're controlling how much current's going to the motor. 
you've got a, a loop where you're controlling the velocity of the motor and then finally a loop where you're controlling position. Now these things relate to one another, they're not completely independent obviously, but uh, you can generate a good control system to control all these parameters within some acceptable range. And so this is extremely common in my world of robotics and uh, Encoders are something that are, are very common. And there's many different types of encoders as well. Sometimes what you care about is getting a very precise position. Sometimes you just care about a rough position. So there's different uh, resolutions of encoders that you might use. Now, one thing about encoders, you notice that uh, the sensing element is always on the motor. This is a good way to do control. Even in the upper figure, the tachometer is measuring the speed of the motor itself, not the speed of the driven machine because the gear reducer, unless it's broken, <laughs> right, is going to pretty much guarantee a particular speed ratio. Now, if it's not really a gear reducer, if it's a belt, you know, variable belt setup, then yeah, maybe you want to measure the speed of the driven machine. But most times it's better to measure the speed of the motor itself, uh, or in this case, or in the lower case, for servo control, measuring the position of the motor itself before you go through a gearbox for reduction because you get a higher resolution off the motor. Most of the time what you do is you, you decrease the speed coming out of the motor uh, in any of these cases. And so if you can detect, you know, it's, it's basically a more sensitive detection to detect the motor's movement rather than the driven machine movement.